Good afternoon, I'm Ranger Austin. Thank you so much for coming. Highly talented. Really, this is in, intended to be more of an entry level um, how to identify birds of prey or raptors. Uh, we do have a halt watch um, that's getting ready to occur here, um, and that's in reference to the uh, raptor migration. Um, and I'll get into more of that in a little bit. But uh, my hope also is for you to be able to use some of the tips that I'm going to go through and that'll allow for you to be able to identify uh, several different birds of prey uh, and maybe understand a little bit more uh, about their habitat, uh, their behavior, and hopefully the importance um, of getting out and doing some bird watching. I had to put the sound in in case nobody got the joke. So we're going to go over basic bird ID, um, and this isn't just for folks that live in um, more rural um, environments, but for also folks that are in an urban setting. Um, it's very likely that you could see birds of prey uh, right in the middle of uh, Nags Head. Uh, we'll talk about the International Halt Watch uh, in the, uh, just a bit. And also, uh, just like with our, uh, part of our mission is to provide outdoor um, recreational opportunities, uh, this helps uh, promote um, education and then also you getting out and just enjoying the outdoors. So what is a raptor? Do you have any, any idea of what makes a bird of prey a raptor? As, as compared to say songbirds and, and uh, other type of birds? We'll get to that in just a second. This is a cool video I like to share. Did you see the hawk? It came out of nowhere. Typically what happens in reality when we're out bird watching, if we're in a park or in a, an outdoor setting, um, you may be able to see a, a bird, some type of bird of prey soaring high up above. But in my experience, most of the time what happens is you're simply walking along a trail or you're driving down a country road and then out of nowhere uh, a, a bird of prey comes flying by. And you know, unless you really knew specific characteristics about that certain species of bird, you may not be able to identify them. So again, hopefully some of the tips that I'm going to share today will help you to be able to identify uh, birds in flight, especially if they just zoom right by you. So what makes a bird of prey a raptor? Well, it has a hooked beak just like this eagle here, and that allows for, the, for them to tear into meat and to feed. This falcon right here has a tomial tooth. It's actually not a tooth, but it's an edging uh, that allows for it again to rip into meat. And I believe raptor means uh, seize with force or seize by force. So they're very strong uh, birds. Also, large talons, so a hook beak and large talons, just like this owl and this osprey, very strong. And this is a grown man's hand, and this is the foot and talons of a mature eagle, so you can see how large it is. Also, birds of prey um, have very strong um, eyesight. And it's thought that an eagle has eight times the vision of a human. Um, it's thought that uh, an owl, possibly a great horned or a barred owl, can see a rabbit from two miles away. Most birds of prey, their eyesight is one and a half times larger than other birds. And owls are thought to have almost twice the eyesight for a bird of its size or not eyesight, but actual eyeballs. And I'll pass this out in a little bit. This is an excellent uh, reference sheet that we do use in the field, and you can reference this to help uh, be able to identify some of the birds we're gonna go through in just a moment. So the migration, um, we're starting to experience birds of prey and other birds uh, migrating south from Canada. Most of the birds that will fly over jockeys will probably be coming from eastern Canada. Uh, they'll go down the Atlantic coast and inland, um, make their way into Mexico, South America, and some may even travel as far south as South America. 
So it's cool to think about while we're out there doing our hawk watch that some of the birds that are going to be crossing um, over the ridge could potentially make their way all the way down to South America, which is really cool. And these are just, these are the flight pa um, paths that these birds will be taking. So at another park that I worked at, we did a hawk watch there at Hanging Rock and we conducted our hawk watch up on top of Moore's Knob. And about two years ago, in one day, we had over 2,000 broadwing hawks fly over in masses. And what they do is when the weather starts to warm up in the morning and they're getting updraft winds, which they use for flight, they start to bunch up and it's called kettling. And this is what kettling looks like. Pretty impressive. So I've broken this presentation down into different categories. Um, there are several different categories that birds of prey fall into. So the first we're going to go ahead and jump right into are the, are the occipiters. And these four right here are kind of the common uh, occipiters that we should see uh, in North Carolina and possibly flying over jockeys. These are smaller birds. And I, we're going to go ahead and start getting into some tips on how to be able to identify each of these different category of birds and maybe even that exact species. One of the tips that we want to try and learn, and it can be a challenge, is uh, their, their call or their song. Each of these different categories or the birds themselves have different calls. So even if you're in the woods or out on the ridge and you can't see them, you may, may still be able to hear them. So we like to use this silhouette here um, to show you at least what the silhouette will be like if they fly overhead, depending on the time of the day, sunlight, um, and a few other factors. We may only be able to see the bird from up top and not be able to see different markings. But if you study each of these different silhouettes, they do have physical uh, differences. So if, for example, the Cooper's hawk has a long tail and it's rounded on the edge, whereas the female sharp shin hawk has a groove in her tail. And these are all, some can be subtle differences, but the big things that we're really looking for are the wing length and the tail length. So again, with the occipiters, they're a smaller bird um, and they're built for speed and agility and they actually hunt other birds, small rodents, um, by uh, traveling quickly through the woods. So for these birds, they've adapted to have long tails that they use as rudders, and this allows for them to quickly cut through uh, thicket areas and woods. Uh, they're not really high flyers. Uh, they're not really built for soaring, but for speed and agility. Let's see. This is uh, an occipiter that's in flight. So another um, way to be able to identify birds is their flight behavior or their flight patterns. So if you look at this guy, he flat, flat glides, flat, flat glides, flat, flat glides. So if you see a bird like that fly in, it's very possible that it's going to be an occipiter. I'm going to backtrack for just a minute. Another basic tip that we can learn over time are the markings. So you can see here with the Cooper's hawk, it has dark bands and there's several bands on its tail. But with the sharp shin, there's only three large bands on the, underneath its tail. So if you're able to get a glimpse of the markings, that'll help you identify what type of bird it is. The next category we're going to talk about are the Buteos. And these are probably the most famous or most common uh, birds that, we've, uh, that we may be familiar with. And these are going to be, for example, the red-shouldered hawk. Most everybody is familiar with the red shoulder. But are you familiar with the broadwing? You know, just a little while ago I said we had almost 2,000 broadwings fly over our park one day. These birds are more known for soaring at higher um, altitudes. 
And the reason for this is they've ad adapted to be able to have really long wingspans, but they're also fairly broad. What's the difference between this bird and the occipiter family, other than the wings? The tail, absolutely. Yeah, it has a shorter, more rounded tail because it hunts its prey from high above and it's able to save its energy by soaring at high, at high altitudes with these nice wings they have. Now, this is a great picture that actually a park visitor sent me on the left. Can you find the bird in the picture? Right here. There is a red shoulder that, someone, that one of our visitors saw. And I wanted to put this in, in here to help show how well um, camouflaged uh, birds are and other mammals. The red tail, it has different markings from the occipiters and some of the other birds we've looked at. It has several bands underneath its tail. It has a dark uh, head with a white throat and these pedigeum markings right between its, shoulder, its wrist and its head right in here. Now it has a wingspan of about 47 inches on average. So from tip to tip, its wingspan is almost 47 inches on average. That's a large bird. This is a red tail with fledg fledglings, it's babies. Isn't that cute? Now watch the flight behavior or pattern of uh, this red, red tail. You see how it soars? Remember how the occipiters flap, flap, glide? So if you see a bird like this in the sky, it's very likely it'll be in the Budio family. So even if you don't know the exact species, at least you can categorize it. Beautiful. This is the red shoulder. And see how its bands under its tail are black with thin white lines. So if you're able to remember different markings on even just the tail, you may be able to figure out what species of raptor it is. It's got a wingspan on average of around 40 inches. This is one of my favorite birds, the broad wing. And look, it has one main white band and a dark band on the end of its tail feathers. It's got a wingspan on average of around 34 inches. It's not that important to, to really know the exact um, length of its wingspan, but at least being able to visualize and make comparisons between these categories. I was talking earlier about the reality of behind actually birding or attempting to locate or identify a certain bird, like a bird of prey. Well, this was a place where I used to live, and I, I was in a wooded community, and I used one of my tips to be able to identify the bird at first. I heard it, I listened, and I, I heard the call. So then I started looking up waiting to see where it was coming from. And out of nowhere, a broad wing flew up. And it hung out for just a, a second or two. And then it flew off. Not very loud. But this is what I heard on that day when I took that video. I heard its cry. This is a, a beautiful video of two red shoulders. And they're dimorphic, meaning that the male and the female will be of different body sizes and potentially coloration differences. And remember, don't text and fly. 
So another category are our falcons. And we're going to have very soon, hopefully, one of the fastest animals on the planet fly over uh, Jockey's Ridge. And does anybody know what the fastest animal is? Or at least bird? The peregrine falcon, it can get up to between 150 and 200 miles an hour. Now look at its silhouette. It's considerably different from the other, other categories we've already seen. What are some differences? It's bigger. The wingspan seems bigger. How about pointed tips like this? They have sharp wings, longer tails. And why do you think that is? How are they able to utilize those characteristics? What kind of flight behavior do you think they'll have? You think they're fast? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they are built for speed. The American kestrel is one of the prettiest birds that we'll see. Look at these beautiful colorations here. Its markings are different from the other, others. It almost seems like it's more speckled on its wings. And they're about the size of a blue jay, so you know how big a blue jay is. They have the ability to hover in flight They're actually one of the smaller birds of prey. It's about 21 inches, kind of like the occipiters. Now, if you see this bird flying, you probably should be able to pick out, uh, determine what species it is. This bird has ability to hover. So basically what it's doing is it hovers in one area, it scans the ground, for its prey, possibly um, a, a small rodent. And then it hovers to another area and looks. So it's all constantly hovering around looking and scanning. This is a Merlin, it's in the same family or category. And what does it have there on the post? It called a smaller bird. So they actually stalk smaller birds. The quality isn't the best for this video, but it still shows you its flight behavior, its pattern. It's a smaller bird, but it's quick. And it's able to fly close to the ground searching for its prey. And this is kind of one of the stars of the show right here, the peregrine falcon. We've already discussed its silhouette. It's got pointy tips on its wings and a longer pointy tail. And what it actually does is it uh, climbs to a uh, high altitude and then it pulls its wings in into what they call a stoop or a dive when it finds its prey. And then basically like a bullet, it goes directly for its prey. Right before getting to its prey, which would be a smaller bird, it throws its wings out kicks its legs back, grabs the bird, and then flies out to wherever its roost is, or nest, nesting area. Now in North Carolina, several of our parks are, ha are perfect habitat for a peregrine falcon. Like at Hanging Rock, they have sheer rock walls that can be a couple hundred feet um, high. Peregrine actually don't build nests, but they find depressions on the edge of rock walls or faces. And from here, they're able to protect their young, but then also have a clear sight of any potential predators, which would maybe be larger birds of prey. These peregrine are actually utilized in skyscrapers because they basically assimilate um, rock walls. This is a per peregrine taking on a, a, an eagle. So they are fearless. And this is really where their eyesight, their excellent eyesight really helps them out. 25 Gs it pulls when it's in a stoop. And if any of y'all have ever been on a roller coaster and you felt that pressure on your body, that's what the peregrine are experiencing. But they have adapted to be able to ha handle that. 
Another uh, category is simply just the northern harrier, harrier. And we will see these birds out here. You usually find them in wetland areas. They utilize open fields. So especially in eastern North Carolina, we have several um, areas that are uh, ma major agricultural areas. So it's perfect habitat um, for the northern harrier. It hunts close to the ground. It's easy to distinguish the northern harrier from some of these other birds because it has a really long tail. It's got a fairly long wingspan. Its head looks almost like an owl. But one of the easiest ways to pick this guy out is it has a white patch on its rump. And it's easy to see when it's in flight. And if you can see here, it has an owl-like um, face, like an owl that has uh, facial discs, which are feathers that are, uh, surround its eye. And that allows for it to pick up sounds. So it has um, uh, increased uh, hearing ability. But these are just some enlarged pictures again, showing the bird. Like I said, a white rump uh, patch, long narrow wings. This allows for it to glide close to the ground while it's hunting for its prey. And it has a wingspan of, on average of around 41 inches. And watch its flight behavior. Like I mentioned, it hunts in open fields. It's flying fairly close to the ground. And right now it's looking and also trying to hear its prey. And even from a distance, you can still see the white rump on it. And they are actually ground nesters. They build their nests on the ground, not in trees. And this is one protecting its fledglings. Another category of birds that we may see in the area are kites. Now they are built for um, aeronautics. They're very agile. And if you see them flying in the air, you may be able to pick them out because they have a unique um, flight pattern. They have fairly long wings and a tail. They really don't have any major markings, but it's their color that you'll be able to uh, recognize. It's more of a slate gray color. 31 inch wingspan. These are some of the silhouettes. So in reality, this is probably what we're gonna be looking at when we're conducting our hawk watch, when we're trying to identify the birds themselves is we may not be able to see the markings, but we can at least use our knowledge of the silhouettes to determine possibly what type of bird it is. There is its call. That sounds much different from the other birds, doesn't it? Now watch its flight. It's trying to show off, I think. It's kind of a daredevil. See that? Okay, eagles, these are uh, the kings of the sky. And everybody should be able to identify an eagle. An obvious white head with a really long wingspan. The photo on the left here I actually took, this is down in Buffer County on the Pamlico River. Perfect habitat for eagles. They can roost in trees right near the shoreline where they can hunt. They can also keep an eye out for possible predators. And what would be a predator uh, against the eagle? Possibly a great horned owl and man. Here is its silhouette. And in just a moment, we're gonna look at another bird that may be misidentified as an eagle from a distance. And I'll talk more about that in a second. 
but it has a long wingspan, fairly broad wings or wide. And like the Buteos that we looked at earlier, like the red shoulder, it has a shorter rounded tail. So this allows for it to soar. It has on average an 83 inch wingspan from tip to tip. Pretty incredible, huh? Very impressive. This was a video that one of my previous supervisors took while she was walking through the woods. And you can just barely see it. But if you're observant and quiet, You may be surprised when you're walking through the woods what's up there. That was an eagle that was roosting. These birds are built uh, for strength and power. They have really large wingspans, and that allows for them to pull um, large fish or other prey out of the water. Their feet and talons are extremely strong and forceful, and that allows for them to rip into the meat and then they're able to use their massive wingspans to power through and take their prey on to where they can uh, eat it. Now, it is possible that uh, an eagle will have its talons stuck in, it, like, say, a fish, and it may be so large that he can't fly out, pull it out of the water. Eagles have the ability to swim, so they'll actually swim to shore. And these are some examples of eagle nests. This photo right here was taken at Goose Creek State Park. And it's in either an old cypress, uh, probably an old cypress tree. And look how massive that nest is. Now this is definitely a bird of prey that we have here. And actually this summer we had an active nest on our sound side, and this is osprey. Ospreys have adapted to be able to thrive in these coastal environments. But you also will find, find them inland, say on larger bodies of water, where they can hunt for fish. They're really one of the only birds that eat, exclusively eats fish. So here's its silhouette. Now the one thing you want to try to remember um, about ospreys is that its wrists right here, or its wingspan, creates a W or an M. And you will be able to pick that out. 63-inch wingspan, so it's a fairly large bird. And I took this video, uh, I think within the past couple months, over at our Soundside Access area. There were actually a number of osprey over there one morning hunting. It has fairly limited markings, but you can look at its coloration with either kind of a darker gray and a, a lighter color underneath. But remembering the M or W shaped wings will really help you out. Plus it's call, you, can, you should be able to remember uh, and pick out it's call. Now they are built for life uh, on the water or near the water. and it just grabbed a flounder. Actually, on the pads of its feet, it has uh, almost an abrasive feel, and that allows for the feet to hold on to slimy fish. Also, they're utilizing their vision, so they're able to pick out the prey from you know, a distance away, and then they lock in on it. And you can see that was like a dart that went right into the water. I believe it's called a nictating membrane, and that's um, like a third eyelid that some birds have um, that allow for it to protect its eyes when it's in flight. Now vultures, this is the bird I was talking about earlier that may be misidentified with an eagle. They have very similar body types uh, when they're in flight. Vultures, in my opinion, really do have one of the, the prettiest flight patterns. They're excellent soars. And why do you think that is? 
What, is one th one, what do you think one difference is between vultures and most other birds? Vultures have an excellent sense of smell. Most other birds have little to no sense of smell. So why does it have an excellent sense of smell? What does it eat? It eats carrion or basically dead animals. So vultures aren't dependent on being stealth-like and quick and fast because what do they eat? They eat carrion or dead animals. But they are dependent on their sense of smell so that they can locate their prey, which is already dead, usually. Now, like I mentioned a, a little while ago, some people may misidentify a uh, vulture with an eagle or vice versa because they have similar body types. Now that doesn't sound like any of the other birds of prey, does it? Vulture actually means terror because it tears into meat. So here's what I'm talking about. Here are the two silhouettes. Now to me they seem fairly uh, similar, but you know, as we know if we study them a little bit more, there are some differences. The tail is longer. The eagle has a short rounded tail. The head shape is different. See, the, the vulture looks like it has a smaller nubbed head with its silhouette, and the eagle has a more elongated head. And then also look at the ends of its prim primary feathers here. They're rounded up. Well, these are more straight and almost rounded down. And it's about 67 inches on average, so it will be smaller than an adult uh, mature eagle. But the one thing you want to be able to uh, take away to be able to distinguish this from an eagle is that when an eagle flies, its uh, wings are laid out flat, almost like a board. But with a vulture, its wings are more up. Oh, is that a vulture? Yep. Tail. If you wouldn't have known that, wouldn't have you have thought that that potentially would have been an eagle? Yeah. But the vultures, they'll have their uh, wings canted just a little up, kind of creating a V. So owls, everybody loves owls. We were talking earlier about camouflage. Look how this beautiful barred owl mixes in to the surroundings. And look at, we, we can obviously know it's an owl by its f face shape, but look at its markings also. We have several different type of uh, owls and if you're able to learn the markings, then you can distinguish one owl from the other. Barred owls are one of our most common owls in North Carolina. In eastern North Carolina, right here on the coast, we're lucky that we have large expanses of wetland areas and woodland areas. And that's perfect habitat for owls, such as the barred owl. It has a wingspan of around 43 inches. The great horned owl. And look at the camouflage here. It's nestled up inside a cave depression area. Now, are these actually ears? No, they're actually just feathers. What are they for? They actually depend more on their the facial discs, those feathers around their eyes, and their ears, which are basically holes that aren't even on both sides of the heads like humans, but they're offset. And that improves its hearing. Let's see. Four feet, six inches would be the average wingspan of a great horned owl. The eastern screech owl, again, is another very common uh, owl that we'll find across North Carolina. And once again, look at this camouflage, how this owl is nestled inside this, this tree. It has a wingspan on average of only around 15 inches.
So it's a fairly small bird. And again, look at the amazing camouflage of this uh, screech owl. Now its call is quite a bit different from the barred owl. So those are really the main category of birds of prey. Um, like I said, I didn't want to go into too much detail about each individual species, but at least wanted to give you an overview of the categories and a few examples of some of the birds. So the Hawk Migration Association of North America is an organization um, that uh, is comprised of n n a number of monitoring sites. And I believe currently there's around 200 official sites that are taking part in this Hawk Watch. Here at Jockeys, this will be our first official year conducting it. Um, it starts mid-October and will run through mid-November. And either myself, uh, another park member, or a volunteer will be climbing up to the ridge every morning uh, and essentially trying to identify the different raptor species that are flying over and then also getting a total count. Now this information and the data collected will be passed on to this organization and then at some time over winter, we will be able to go back and look at other monitoring sites to see how many different species and the number of birds flew over those areas. So why is this important? Well, for one, it's cool to be able to know what type of birds are flying over. But really, it helps researchers to understand flight trends or bird species moving into um, uncommon areas during flight or during migration. And ultimately, it helps us to understand trends. So just, I wanted to end with, you can go online and you can actually find numerous examples of reference sheets that you can use to go out in the field or simply go for a hike and see if you can apply some of the things we've discussed to help identify different birds. Uh, again, um, I'm Austin Paul. I really appreciate y'all taking the time to sit back and, and listen to my presentation. I hope that I see y'all out in the field um, and you're more than welcome to come join me for the Hulk Watch and uh, get out, get up, and explore. <laughs>